Chair, who has been responsible for coordinating the events of this great celebration. We will begin by singing High on the Mountaintop under the direction of Sister Clara Arnold. The words of the hymn will appear on the screen, after which the invocation will be given by Brother Stratton Facer. Dear gracious, kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the beautiful Idol Falls Temple. We are grateful for um, all the people who have sacrificed to make this dedication and this great celebration possible. We are very grateful for all of our organizers, leaders, and participants who have put so much time into this event. We are so very grateful for the works that are performed within the church or within the temple and the sealing ordinance of the priesthood. We are so very grateful for the leadership in the church, in particular our prophet Thomas S. Monson, his counselors, and the apostles, and all the other general authorities in the church. We ask that our performance today will be pleasing unto thee and all those who are watching. We ask that thy spirit will be here in abundance and that missionary and temple work will fill the earth. We are very grateful for all the many blessings we have given and uh, we, are great, we are very grateful for this gospel in our lives. We say these things humbly in the name of Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother Facer. We thank all those who have worked so tirelessly to make this event possible and have given countless hours of marvelous service. We are looking forward to the performance of song and dance that you youth 
from the Idaho Falls, Idaho Temple District will be sharing. It will now be our privilege and blessing to hear from President Henry B. Eyring. Following President Eyring's remarks, the youth from the Idaho Falls, Idaho Temple District will present the program. President Eyring. My dear young brothers and sisters, I am so grateful to be with you to celebrate the rededication of the beautiful Idaho Falls, Idaho Temple. It is a great privilege for me to be back in a place and among people who are so dear to me. The young people and your leaders have made great preparations for this exciting event. On behalf of President Thomas S. Monson, the prophet of God, I welcome you and thank you for your time and talent. President Monson loves you, and he loves these celebrations featuring the youth of the Church as we dedicate temples. I am thrilled with the opportunity to enjoy this wonderful event with you. There are at least three great blessings that will come to you through your participation tonight. First and foremost, you will grow in your faith that temples are an important part of the Lord's work to bring the light of the gospel into your life and the lives of thousands of others. Our hope is that the memory of the light you have felt as you prepared and performed words, music, and dancing will never be dimmed by time or by darkness in the world. Second, it is the prophet's hope and the Lord's intent that your experience in preparing and participating together will build in you recognition of the power God grants when we work unitedly in His cause. What you feel tonight is the fulfillment of the promise of the Savior, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. You will never forget the feeling of being united with the Lord in His service. And third, it is the Lord's desire that you will remember that God has shown His love for you, your family, and all of the people of this temple district by placing a holy temple of the Lord here. As you qualify for the blessings of this temple, God will honor the covenants you make. If you are faithful, He will give you the blessings of eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. This is a celebration of light, unity, hope, and faith in every footstep, every dance step, and every musical note. Your performance tonight is part of the wonder God will perform in your life and in the lives of others. Its effects can last forever. Now, let the miracles and wonders of this night begin. God bless you.
Isaiah 41, 18. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry lands springs of water. In the beginning, the winding river ran, its course determined over eons by forces irresistible, its clear, clean water flowing unimpeded to the hungry Columbia and from there to the great sea. But the land, the land was another matter. It is a dreary desert of sand and gravel. The dark and ugly appearance of this plain obtained for it the name of the Sage Desert. The only people that will stay in that valley are the ones who will be buried there. This is unquestionably the most barren of all mountain deserts. It abounds in absinthe, cactus, and such plants and herbs are chiefly found on the arid lands. We had to resort to fishing for the support of life, and our beasts of burden were compelled to fast and pine, for scarcely a mouthful of grass could be found. From the mountains bordering the Snake River Valley on the north, to Fort Hall, a travel distance of 100 miles, there is but one fertile spot that could be converted into any useful purpose. It is a land where no man permanently resides, a vast uninhabited solitude with precipitous cliffs and yawning ravines, vast desert tracts that must ever defy cultivation, interposed with dreary and dry wilds between the habitations of man and the traversing of which the wanderer will often be in the danger of perishing. During Brigham Young's time, the Snake River Valley was referred to as not yet the place. It was too far away, too cold, too desolate. But a prophet of God saw beyond the sagebrush and sand. President Wilfred Woodruff reported in General Conference of 1898 that he heard Joseph Smith say in 1833, There will be tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints who will be gathered in the Rocky Mountains, and there they will open the door for the establishing of the gospel among the Lamanites, who will receive the gospel and their endowments and the blessings of God. This people will go into the Rocky Mountains. They will build temples to the Most High. The native peoples of this place passed through the arid landscape, leaving no more trace than arrowheads buried in the ever-present sand. But in 1834, a trading post called Fort Hall sprang up, and there began to be commerce between the desert dwellers and the incoming settlers. In 1855, Fort Lemhi was established. The post at Fort Hall did not succeed and was abandoned. Eventually rebuilt, it was once again the fur trading center for the area until 1870, when it was turned over to the native people.
In spite of the inhospitable landscape, as early as 1865, a few hardy families began making their homes in the valley carved by the wandering snake. They called their new home Eagle Rock for the great birds that nested in the rocks along the river. Their problem was how to grow food in a land so dry. Rain was scarce, and so another answer would have to be found. The waters of the Snake River could bring life to the land and its bounty harvested, if only it could be diverted from its headlong race to the sea. Shovels, sweat, and dogged determination began to change the face of the valley. Precious water started flowing and crops began to grow. Spadeful by spadeful, the canals were dug and the dry desert soil began to yield its riches. June 1879 brought the railroad to Eagle Rock. A repair station for the Utah Northern Line was established and LDS church members were hired to grade and lay the track from Ogden to Eagle Rock. That same year, church president John Taylor gave specific approval for LDS settlements in the Snake River Valley. Although not officially called to settle, more and more church members saw the potential of the land by the river and came to give it a try. By 1880, the valley had begun to blossom. The census that year listed the population of Eagle Rock as 250 residents. By 1900, this number had risen to 1,450. The river yielded its water, along with Willow and Sand Creek, and gradually the sand gave way to soil and the sagebrush to cultivated crops. In 1882, the first LDS ward, called the Bannock Ward, was established with Thomas E. Ricks as its bishop. But life was hard in those early years. Every blade of grass or ear of corn was purchased at the cost of much toil and tears. Nothing was easy, and at times, people were tempted to give up. 
In 1884, elders Wilfred Woodruff and Heber J. Grant visited the discouraged saints of the Snake River Valley and admonished them to remain on their homesteads. They were promised the day would come when the soil would yield forth its strength and that flowers, trees, fine homes, schools, and meeting houses would beautify the land from one end to the other. Be not discouraged, be not disheartened, because God's blessing is upon this land. It will only be a little time until there will be prosperous and happy settlements of the Latter-day Saints here. God will bless and multiply this land. In 1885, James Steele arrived to settle in the Sand Creek area. He also saw a vision of what this valley would become. About two years ago, we went driving in the country. We drove into the hills until we had a panoramic view. I said, here is what I saw in my dream, the vision I had years ago when I first came here. It is just as I saw it then. The time of year was just as the grain was ready to be cut, and before me, I saw trees, orchards, barns, and homes, just as I had seen in my dream, exactly. Heber C. Austin was president of Bingham Stake from 1908 to 1925. He also envisioned a temple being right where the old Eagle Rock Ward stood on the banks of the river next to the LDS Hospital. The story of southeastern Idaho during the first five decades from 1880 to 1930 fulfilled much of President Woodruff's prophecy and also the dream of President Steele. The land was transformed from semi-arid plateau with limited vegetation into ranches with flocks and herds, into farms with fertile productive fields, into towns and cities with beautiful homes, schools, attractive well-built churches, and hundreds of flourishing businesses. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And so the river flowed. And as it did, the grass grew greener, the corn tasseled higher, and the people prospered. An interest in genealogy, which appropriately precedes temple work, was manifest early in Idaho Falls. The first multiple stake genealogical convention in the church was held in Idaho Falls on the 17th and 18th of January, 1922. About 800 people from Yellowstone, Fremont, Rigby, Teton, Bingham, Shelley, Pocatello, Blackfoot, and Port Neuf Stakes attended its seven sessions, which were under the direction of Elder Joseph Fielding Smith of the Council of the Twelve. I call this meeting of the Idaho First Ward Genealogical Society to order. Welcome to everyone. Let us begin with our slogan, led by Sister Smith. Thank you, Sister Brunt. Please repeat with me. We stand for a family record in every home and a temple in Idaho. Idaho Falls, Idaho. The saints continued to hope and pray for a temple to be built. Many thought the perfect site was along the banks of the Snake River. Originally, there was just sand dunes, undulating hills, and a valley that supported only cactus and sagebrush. To the geologist, it was a wind and weather deposit of sand on a bed of basalt. City leaders understood that a temple in Idaho Falls would bring many people and would be a good influence in the area for culture, activity, and growth. It would also provide construction jobs, not only on the temple itself, but on homes that people would build to be close to the temple. The president of the Idaho Falls Chamber of Commerce, who was not a member of the LDS Church, was anxious to invite President Heber J. Grant to meet with the Chamber of Commerce and other business leaders. The Chamber drafted a letter to President Grant on June 11, 1936, inviting him to visit Idaho Falls to discuss the possibility of building a temple here. President Grant came from Salt Lake later that year. In this 1936 meeting, the chamber president told President Grant that if the church decided to build the temple in Idaho Falls, the people in the business community would contribute the site. President Grant has responded and accepted the offer of the Chamber of Commerce and the local business leaders. 
we can proceed to obtain the site along the east bank of the Snake River, just north of the LDS Hospital. The church will build the Idaho Temple on that site in Idaho Falls. As soon as the announcement of the temple site had been made, Idaho Falls and North Idaho Falls stakes hosted an ironic priesthood pilgrimage to the site on Saturday, May 15, 1937 at 4.30 p.m. The four stakes within the area, Rigby, Shelley, Idaho Falls, and North Idaho Falls were invited to attend. About 1,200 boys between the ages of 12 and 20 were invited with their supervisors and teachers. More than 1,100 came. Following the program, a baptismal service was held under the direction of Bishop William S. II of the Shelley First Ward. A priest from each stake officiated in a baptism in the river of someone selected from his stake. Games and sports were played by the boys. At night, a large bonfire was lit, and the boys roasted hot dogs and sat around the blaze listening to stories told by their leaders.
accompanied by a spirit of rejoicing. On October 19, 1940, the site was officially dedicated and the cornerstone laid for the first LDS temple in Idaho. Mayor Chase A. Clark proclaimed a city holiday. John R. Talmadge of the Deseret News wrote, Ranking is the outstanding event of church history in Idaho and is one of the apocal marks in church and gem state history. The site of the 10th temple to be built since the organization of the church was dedicated and the cornerstone of the edifice laid here today. President J. Reuben Clark Jr. of the First Presidency conducted the services and delivered the principal address, while David O. McKay of the First Presidency laid the cornerstone and offered the dedicatory prayer. The crowd almost completely surrounded the building and numbered between 12,000 and 20,000 people. At 11.53 a.m. Saturday morning, October 19, 1940, President David O. McKay pronounced the cornerstone of the half-million-dollar Idaho Falls Temple to be in place. We had a trumpet quartet, which was organized by our seminary instructor, Brother G. Osmond Dunford. Besides Brother Dunford, there was Beth Miller, Lewis Hansen, and me, Earl Hansen. As I recall, there were no plans to play on the hospital roof when we were asked to play, but the situation just seemed to lend itself to performing from there. We rode to Idaho Falls with Brother Dunford, and as we arrived at the temple location, he said, Wouldn't it be nice if we could play from the top of the hospital? Without telling anyone, we immediately rushed to the hospital, took the elevator to the top floor, and hurried out to the roof. The program had started, and our number was being announced. We were not quite ready, so Brother Dunford had me play a tuning note to let people know where we were. We played An Angel from on High, which Brother Dunford had adapted for four trumpets, and it was one of the highlights of my life. the ceremonies, hundreds toured the structure of which only the foundation and some walls were completed. It had been just over 100 years since the cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple was laid on April 16, 1841. 
It would take five years before the Nauvoo Temple was finally dedicated. Just so, five long years would pass before the Idaho Falls Temple would be dedicated. But as thousands pondered the blessings of this sacred event, the voice and message of the Prophet Joseph Smith, as had been declared at Nauvoo 100 years before, came vividly to mind. Let the mountains shout for joy, and all ye valleys cry aloud, and all ye seas and dry lands tell the wonders of your eternal King, and ye rivers and brooks and rills flow down with gladness. Let the woods and all the trees of the field praise the Lord, and ye solid rocks weep for joy, and let all the sons of God shout for joy. Surely the river was flowing with gladness, and the solid rock supporting the cornerstone foundation wept for joy, and the mountains shouted for joy. In 1940, Idaho Falls was a growing community of 15,000 people with two LDS stakes. The valley was beginning to realize its promise. The water from its river was nourishing the land, and now the water of life would nourish its people. And verily I say unto you, let this house be built unto my name, that I may reveal mine ordinances therein unto my people. Construction on the temple began in 1940 and continued into 1941, when it was interrupted by World War II, followed closely by a period of depression. There were delays getting steel and aluminum due to the national defense effort. Then Pearl Harbor was bombed and the United States entered the war. Many of the temple construction workers left to join the military. One of them was Woodrow Arrington, who had taken over as lead contractor after the death of Birdwell Finlayson. Brother Arrington was allowed to defer reporting for service for a few months so he could oversee the completion of the exterior walls of the temple. But the interior was far from ready. At the end of the war, construction resumed, and finally, the interior was as beautiful as the exterior. Plans were put in place for the dedication.
May 14, 1945, President Heber J. Grant died and was succeeded as prophet by George Albert Smith. It was President Smith who said, The temple should be the most beautiful place and in the most beautiful spot in Idaho. And so it was. The open house and dedication were held in September of 1945. The dedicatory prayer was offered by President Smith. The beautiful temple on the river was to be the only temple he dedicated. Our hearts are filled with gratitude towards Thee, O God, our Eternal Father, that Thou didst promise, the wilderness and solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. For the fertility of this land, which once was most undesirable and forbidding, now produces in rich abundance delicious grain, fruits, and vegetables. We are most grateful.
The area served by the new temple was vast. The Idaho Falls Temple District covered all of southern Idaho and stretched into Wyoming on the east and Oregon on the west. As the waters of the river flowed by the newly risen spire, so young and old began to flow into the temple to establish their own eternity. From all corners, worshipers came. They brought their ancestors to be sealed and their sons and daughters to be married. They brought the hopes and dreams of today, tomorrow, and forever. The mysteries of the ages were before them as they gazed into the wide, deep river with a tall, gleaming temple reflected in its satiny surface. February 1949, the Atomic Energy Commission announced plans to build the National Reactor Testing Station on government property 50 miles west of Idaho Falls, a spirited competition for the prize of hosting the AEC's new field office sprang up between Arco, Blackfoot, Pocatello, and Idaho Falls. Idaho Falls was selected as the headquarters of the emerging industry. The National Reactor Testing Station, now known as the Idaho National Laboratory, has greatly benefited all the people in the Snake River Valley through the educated and diverse people who came to live and work in the beautiful valley with a river flowing through it. Those families broaden and enliven their towns and surrounding areas. The influx spurred the building of homes, schools, and churches, and improved all aspects of community life. The whole area became known for its fine arts, friendly people, and its beautiful river with spectacular falls. In a small town just north of Idaho Falls, called Rigby, lived a young man with unusual dreams. In his mind, he envisioned a way to transmit images through the air to a receiver. He sketched it all out on the blackboard for his high school science teacher. His name was Philo T. Farnsworth, and his invention is what we know as television. The sandy soil in the country surrounding the river proved perfect for growing potatoes. As the methods of irrigation were mastered, wheat, hay, barley, and beets also began to flourish. About one-third of all the potatoes grown in the United States come from this area. Many Idahoans have grown up working in the spud fields each year.
As agriculture grew into Idaho's dominant industry, workers from Mexico and other countries to the south made their way to the Snake River Valley to help grow and harvest crops. They brought their language, culture, food, colorful costumes, and music. Now their influence can be felt in every corner of the state, and their people make up about 10% of Idaho's population. Thank you. 
For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. As the winding river flows ever onward, so the past becomes the present and glides on into the future. 
The temple by the river still stands, but not alone, as it once did. In 1984, the Boise Temple was dedicated and the saints rejoice. It was followed by the Rexburg Temple in 2007 and the Twin Falls Temple in 2008. The family of the righteous was expanding. Soon, the Meridian Temple will bless the people of the Treasure Valley. And at the April 2017 conference, the faithful saints in Pocatello rejoiced as President Thomas S. Monson announced the Pocatello, Idaho Temple was to be built in the near future. The work of the Lord goes on. As the waters of righteousness will once more flow from beneath the Temple of Jerusalem, so shall the youth of Zion flow from this place out into the world, spreading the gospel of truth and righteousness. I urge our people everywhere, with all of the persuasiveness of which I am capable, to live worthy to hold a temple recommend, to secure one and regard it as a precious asset, and to make a greater effort to go to the house of the Lord and partake of the Spirit and the blessings to be had therein. I am satisfied that every man or woman who goes to the temple in a spirit of sincerity and faith leaves the house of the Lord a better man or woman. There is need for constant improvement in all of our lives. There is need occasionally to leave the noise and the tumult of the world and step within the walls of a sacred house of God there to feel his spirit in an environment of holiness and peace. From this blessed valley, a river of youth emerge, the very elect, saved for just this day. These young warriors carry with them the shield of righteousness and the sword of truth. They go forth to battle the influences of evil, and they will be triumphant. They take with them the courage of their ancestors who settled this valley, the foresight of prophets who saw their day, the teachings of parents with their steadfast devotion, and the love of leaders who serve them. They carry the gospel, like life-giving water, to the parched souls of the children of the Lord, and with love they will bring them home.
Now my young friends who are in your teenage years always had the temple in your sights. Do nothing which will keep you from entering its doors and partaking of the sacred and eternal blessings there. As we witness the renewal and rededication of this holy house of the Lord, so we also renew and rededicate ourselves. We vow to spend our lives in service to Him. We promise to do His work. We will teach as He taught, love as He loved, serve as He served, and we will feed His sheep. We will commit ourselves to Him to our ancestors, and to our posterity through His holy plan of happiness. Like a fire, His Spirit burns within us, and like the mighty river, His gospel will increase.